All right. Um, it is a little after seven. We are still waiting on a few more people, but we're going to get started so we can stay on track. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Fox. I'm Land Stewardship Director here at Sycamore Land Trust. And um, yeah, I hope you are excited to hear what we've got uh, on store tonight. Uh, we have a conversation with Nate Ingbrick, um, herpetologist with the Indiana DNR. He's going to be talking about the amphibians and reptiles of the Bean Blossom Creek watershed. Uh, I've been working with Nate the last couple of years uh, on some projects uh, here at Sycamore Land Trust, and I've got to know him pretty well. I've spent a lot of time in the field together, and he's got a real passion for this, and I think you're going to really enjoy the presentation tonight. I know I have a lot of great pictures. He's a good photographer as well, and uh, uh, done a lot of great work for us and does a lot of great work in the state uh, with the DNR and working with other partners. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it. I'll let Nate kind of tell you what he does and what the DNR does and what he's found here at Bean Blossom Creek area. Um, I wanna, before I go on, I just wanna thank, uh, you know, our Sycamore staff. We've got several here in attendance and I especially wanna thank Kate Hamill for being the tech support behind this and, and organizing a lot of this and Ellen Bergen, land stewardship assistant, part of the stew crew, as we like to call ourselves. And we'll be handling the question and answer portion of the event tonight. And uh, so uh, let's get started. Uh, this is part of a series we've been doing this year called our conservation conversations. And our next one will be in June, June 23rd with Carol Ritter. If you're a Sycamore supporter, you might recognize that name uh, just from his work as education director at Sycamore Land Trust. But Carol has recently published a new book um, and we'll be talking about that book and probably a lot of other things and reminiscing about his time here at Sycamore. And Ellen can tell you some stories as well. And um, so we're looking forward to that. So stay tuned for that and sign up for that one as well. Uh, I'm sure that'll be interesting. I've not got to read the book, but I have page through it's got some magnificent pictures of some magnificent trees so and who doesn't love trees um so if you're not familiar with sycamore I, i'm sure a lot of you are but for those of you that aren't uh let's just give you a little bit of quick background on what sycamore is and what we do uh, our mission is to preserve the beauty health and diversity of southern indiana's natural landscape through strategic land conservation and uh, environmental education uh, and that photo there uh, is a Jefferson Salamander that was taken by a volunteer, uh, actually a high school student in Columbus, Ben Genter, who's volunteering with Sycamore and the DNR, helping us do some herp surveys at our Bartholomew County Preserve, Touch the Earth, and uh, found some really uh, some really interesting things at our one of our vernal ponds there, and uh, we're finding some cool stuff under our cover board. So uh, Nate might talk a little bit about that as well. Um, uh, we do protect at Sycamore, we protect over 10,000 acres on about 120 different properties spread throughout the 26 counties in kind of south central Indiana. Uh, you can kind of get an idea of, of where all we are by that map there. Uh, obviously, we kind of big focus in Monroe and Brown County, but we do cover a big portion of the state, which keeps us really busy. Uh, we were founded in 1990. And we are accredited now with uh, the National uh, Association. Um, as I mentioned, we have over 10,000 acres. We have about 30 uh, miles of trails. Now, we don't have trails on all our properties, but on the 13 preserves, we do have trails. Um, we have one of the biggest boardwalks in the Bean Blossom Creek watershed uh, in the Midwest. And uh, we provide free environmental education programs to kids and adults. We have over 1,200 members and hundreds of volunteers. I was working with a excellent group of them this morning. Uh, one of our flagship preserves is the Bean Blossom uh, Bottoms Nature Preserve. Um, we think it's wonderful, but so do a lot of other people, including the DNR, who has uh, dedicated that as a state dedicated nature preserve, as well as a wetland of distinction and um, an important bird area. And the list can go on and on. And we'll soon be having a bio blitz uh, that will tell us more information about what's going on there. Um, and, uh, and uh, as Nate will tell you, it's an important area for reptiles and amphibians, including our state endangered Kirtland snake, which is uh, something that we're really interested in and in learning more. And that's kind of how this partnership with Nate developed. Um, so we work on protecting land and that's how we protect 
wildlife you know and for me that's what gets me excited is is the the animals the critters but uh protecting land is is the key part to protecting our wildlife uh, uh you know trevlack bluffs if you're familiar with that that's also a state dedicated nature preserve so again a partnership with the dnr uh and is an important uh breeding area for uh, reptiles and amphibians. And in fact, Nate has been working with us to do some surveys there to look at what we have there as well. And then one of the other things we do is besides protecting land, we do restoration work. Uh, this is a view of a property we're doing some wetland restoration on uh, in the Bean Blossom Creek watershed. Uh, we have uh, 80 acres of wetland restoration on store in the next couple of years. Uh, we'll be planting 22,000 trees in the Bean Blossom Creek watershed um, in the next potential week or so. This is a planning we did a couple of years ago at Touch the Earth uh, 2 Nature Preserve, uh, which is on kind of the border of Monroe and Brown County. And here's Nate with his trusty assistant, Jason Myrtle, um, doing one of our cover board checks. And I'm sure Nate will explain more, uh, maybe what cover boards are and how that works. So I won't go into details there, uh, but that is one of the ways we did do some of the survey work we did. Uh, one of the preserves we were doing this was kind of a baseline study and also curious to see if we did have the state endangered Kirtland snake, which we did find, uh, I think, and actually under that cover board or the next one. And so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, what we're here to do is protect land and, and that helps us protect wildlife, you know, the two go hand in hand. Um, and these photos were taken during some of these surveys that, that Nate and I and Ellen and all the staff here and some volunteers have helped work on um, at our Samshine Foundation Preserve, as well as our Touch the Earth Natural Areas Preserve. And so uh, that's that's about all I've got to say. If you want to learn more about us, there's a multitude of ways to do so. A website, give us a call, stop by the office. You might want to plan that ahead of time because we are in the field a lot and a lot of us are still working from home. But um, we do have our office here in Bloomington and. Um, We'd be happy to, to give you more information. Uh, you can get a copy of our nature preserve guide and to learn where our trails are and learn more about us. And we definitely would encourage you, if you're not a member, become a member to help us do this work. We are a nonprofit, so we really rely heavily on volunteers and donors and, and, and members. So, uh, And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Nate to, um, to give his presentation. If you have questions, throughout the program, enter those in the chat, and Ellen will be checking that, and we will try to answer those either during or after the presentation. And um, and uh, so thanks again, everybody, and a special thanks to Nate for, for doing this on his evening, and uh, appreciate all you do for us, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. I'll stop sharing, and there you go. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate that nice introduction, nice primer actually into what we're gonna talk about tonight. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. We did a trial run of this about a half hour ago and it worked. So let's see if we can see if we can do it again here. All right, can you guys see the screen there? Is it looking, looking good, Kate, from what we looked at earlier? Awesome, okay. Well, I wanna thank everyone for coming out tonight. Thanks so much to Chris for the invitation to come here and talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing um, with Sycamore down in the Bean Blossom Creek Valley. And I'm looking forward to walking through some of what we've uh, been working on. And Chris gave a good primer, good introduction on uh, some of the different critters that we've been finding. There's a Kirtland snake on that, that cover photo right there. That's one of our target species. And so um, it's been pretty exciting. I've really enjoyed it. And so I think just by way of introduction, I'm gonna go ahead and start out with a slide uh, maybe just a little two minute uh, quick description of what the DNR herpetology program is and kind of what we do in the state and use that as a springboard uh, to get into our talk about the Bean Blossom Creek Valley. Um, like Chris said, I, I work as the, the state herpetologist for the Indiana DNR. I'm in the Division of Fish and Wildlife. And so I oversee the program that basically oversees amphibians and reptiles for the state. And in Indiana, we have 95 different species of amphibians and reptiles. There's a few of them in the photo there. And we, we don't necessarily work with every single species, but we do cover a lot of ground and we do uh, end up getting our hands on a lot of these different animals. And so um, most of our work that we do involves um, basically state listed or 
species are there list, uh, state endangered species or those listed as special concern. So collectively, we call those species of conserv great, greatest conservation need. And basically, uh, we're trying to target the species that are the most imperiled or maybe have the most conservation concerns associated with them. Um, we do work with a lot of other um, different amphibians and reptiles as well. We tend to focus on endangered species like in the top center there, we've got this crawfish frog. That's been a, a major species we've been working on. I actually did my grad, I did my graduate work on crawfish frogs. And frankly, I could probably talk about them for the rest of the night, but I'm gonna move on to that little salamander in the upper right there. That's a green salamander. That's one of our ultra rare species. And so we tend to focus on these, uh, but sometimes during our, our projects, we'll focus on a specific property or a specific area where we kind of want to go in and just see what's there and um, do a bit of an inventory. And, and that's been a little bit of what we've been doing uh, with sycamore. It's actually been kind of a blending of focusing on a rare species like state endangered Kirtland snakes, but also on some of these different properties, uh, these different nature preserves that sycamore owns. So um, as we kind of talk about these two nature preserves, I want to kind of do a, a quick precursor on the Bean Blossom Creek Valley or the Bean Blossom Creek Corridor, because that has been kind of a focal zone for us. Both of the preserves that we're working on, uh, the Shine Foundation Preserve and Trev Lake Bluffs are located within this valley. I personally think the Bean Blossom Creek Valley is what I would call a, like a significant, phys like a physiographic feature in South Central Indiana. This is a feature that um, consists, and some of you know it from being down at Bean Blossom Bottoms, but it's a pretty level, flat terrain that contains a lot of moist soil and wetlands. And it's nested within this landscape that is pretty dry and hilly. It's nested within a very dry, well-drained area. And I believe that the Bean Blossom Creek Corridor there um, provides a pr fairly significant habitat corridor across Northern Monroe and Northern Brown counties in this dry landscape. And of course, it includes a lot of different habitats that we'll talk about. So that of course is the Bean Blossom Creek uh, the actual creek itself there in the blue line and it, it connects to the uh, the white river that comes down from Indianapolis there in northwest Monroe County. If you look at a topographic map, um, if you're familiar with how topographic maps work, the, 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 uh, the parts of the map with the most lines or the most brown lines that are close together are areas with a lot of topographic relief, so a lot of hills and valleys. Now on this image here, I just took this uh, topographic map, you can see that Bean Blossom Valley as the, the, the features, the, the kind of the white zone starting in the upper right hand corner, kind of dipping down into the middle of a kind of a U-shaped uh, kind of thing there, and then going back up to the upper left hand portion of the image. That's that valley, those areas that are kind of plain white nested within the hill country there. And uh, I just wanted to show this as kind of a kind of a, a visual for what we're looking at in terms of like that physiographic, that ge geological or geographic feature there, how it stands out from the surrounding landscape. One of the cool things about having um, a river that's actually not that large of a river that's located in kind of a little bit of an oversized valley is that uh, the river can kind of meander and wind through that valley. It's got space as it flows over time and through the valley to kind of move around. And so some of you will be familiar with uh, river dynamics. This is not a specialty of mine, but it's something that I think is really interesting and that uh, kind of gets involved with amphibians and reptiles as it relates to habitat. So this is an aerial photo of the, the Shine Foundation Nature Preserve. And the blue line is, the, is Bean Blossom Creek. And what we've seen out there at this preserve as we've kind of worked the site and just worked through aerial photos and kind of tried to figure it out is we've got these oxbow type of uh, wetlands or sloughs on the pond that I think were probably old channels of Bean Blossom Creek or at least overflow channels. And so as the creek flows kind of from the bottom right uh, part of this uh, graphic here up, um, historically probably took a turn into that green oxbow. That's probably an old channel. Over time, as the river kind of eroded its banks, it probably cut itself off and blew through to straighten itself out. And what it left was an old channel that eventually became completely cut off from the river just by way of sedimentation and a lack of flow. And now um, an oxbow little channel or a little old channel kind of overflow spot now is a pretty darn good wetland. I mean, it's, it's that one right there is chock full of vegetation. It's just kind of this soupy saturated place. Most normal people wouldn't think it's very appealing. As a herpetologist, I find it quite attractive. I think it's got a lot of, uh, got some interesting herp potential, but we see this out here um, at the Shine Preserve. And another one here, it's not super obvious on the aerial, but when you're out there and you look close, there's a little bit of a bow, a little bit of a bend there. And you can actually uh, see that the river probably cut itself off. And now we've got, now we're left with all these oxbows. It's a real nice one uh, on the Eastern edge of the property. That's almost kind of more like a, a legitimate pond. And so these have become pretty important areas for targeting amphibian and reptile sampling out at the, at the preserve as we're kind of working through it, trying to figure out where these, where these things are hanging out. So the, the Bean Blossom Creek corridor does have some historical significance as it relates to amphibians and reptiles. And one of the critters I mentioned already is the crawfish frog. 
the crawfish frog is actually a species of the prairies. These are a grassland animal. They like spending time out in open grasslands. They get their name because they live in crayfish burrows. Many of you have probably seen these little mud stacked kind of mounds, these little crayfish burrows in your yard or out in a wet field, or sometimes you'll see them along the side of a ditch this time of year. Crawfish frogs actually live in those burrows. They spend most of their lives either in the burrow or sitting right next to the entrance of a crayfish burrow. And they're obligate burrow dwelling frogs. And what's peculiar is that as a prairie species, they historically and even currently extend into parts of Western Indiana. And we've got this old record from a gentleman whose last name was Middleman. I think he was actually an IU professor back in the 40s who described a population of crawfish frogs four miles north of Bloomington. And if you get on Google Earth and measure that out, that places it right near the confluence of, of Griffey Creek and Bean Blossom Creek. And then about 30 years later, the father of Indiana herpetology, Sherman Minton, noted crawfish frogs occurrence in the grassy valleys of Bean Blossom Creek. And any of us who are from the Bloomington area know that this isn't exactly a prairie region. This is this is densely forested region. But for whatever reason, uh, that Bean Blossom Valley contains some habitat features that a species more typical of the western prairies uh, made its home in. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think they probably occur down in the valley anymore. Our most recent record that I would consider somewhat reliable is from the early 90s. That was the last somewhat reliable record we have from those, actually from an area right near the Bean Blossom Bottoms Nature Preserve. I've been out there and done some surveys. I haven't been able to find them, but they are still hanging on at other sites in Southwest Indiana. Um, but I think it's significant that this frog showed up um, in this area that's, that's typically forested and very dry, um, given that it's an, it's an open prairie species uh, that likes to hang out in, in areas where you get a lot of these crayfish burrows. The other species that we're gonna talk about tonight uh, that's been kind of a flagship species for us on this project is this state endangered Kirtland snake. These are, in my view, kind of the darlings of the Midwestern snake world because they're not very large. They have pretty pink bellies and they just don't bite very much. And you can't ask for a better combination <laughs> for, a, for a small snake. But um, these are a state endangered species. We are actually finding them in more places uh, than we had historically. They're, they're turning up, they're a, they're a very secretive snake. And so um, it's easy to overlook these guys. They live um, beneath underground a lot of times. They're fairly fossorial. Uh, they will inhabit crayfish burrows. They really like to make use of those crayfish burrows, kind of like a crawfish frog. Um, and they're strangely, notoriously known for um, persisting in urban environments. So a lot of our records for Kirtland snakes are actually from the Indianapolis area. There's records down near Louisville, Cincinnati. And I think in those situations, they managed to persist partly because there's a lot of kind of refuse and kind of scrap and trash, old, you know, old fields and abandoned lots. They'll be under pieces of concrete and cardboard. They really like that moist soil and they'll get under there and eat worms and slugs. And they just, they really like that. And I think that uh, probably being a fossorial and secretive species has given them some protection from domestic predators like cats and dogs. So uh, they hang out in urban areas, but they are also um, big time inhabitants of uh, some of these floodplain areas. So down along the Muscatatuck River, we've got some pretty good populations and uh, they've been known from the Bean Blossom Bottoms region since at least the 1990s. And so they're still hanging on. And so as Chris and I were talking here a couple of years ago, you know, we got to thinking, you know, are these guys at Shine Nature Preserve? Are, are they out there? It's not far from the Bean Blossom Bottoms. It's got this bottomland habitat um, along the creek there. And so that was one that became a major focal species for us. So I think it was around, Chris, you mentioned, I think it might've been around uh, mid to late 2020 when we started having some conversations about maybe doing something at, at this somewhat newly acquired preserve, this, the Shine Foundation Preserve out there and trying to understand what amphibians and reptiles are there before restoration activities begin, which should be happening here pretty soon. And so we kind of wanted to do a pre-restoration inventory, an all-out inventory at Shine Nature Preserve to see what species are there. And then um, the other property that I mentioned, Trevlack Bluffs, we were interested in because it also contains these bottom land, uh, good floodplain situations where Kirtland snakes, in my opinion, should be. We're having some trouble finding them out there, but uh, they have been uh, searched there before. The Nature Conservancy actually did a survey there back in 2008 at Trevlack struck out. They lost a bunch of their cover boards uh, to a flood. They're probably still floating around Lake Lemon. But um, yeah, we've, we've revisited that site and want to see what we can find. And so those are our two focal sites for tonight. Um, I've got this another map here, just kind of showing where they're at. Shine is the preserve on the left. That's Northwest Monroe County. And then uh, Bean Bloss, or Trevlack Bluffs rather, is along Bean Blossom Creek over in Northwest Brown County. So let's talk about the actual surveys that we did. Chris mentioned this before, but one of our main techniques for focusing on snakes was to deploy the use of cover boards. And so cover boards are basically pieces of wood or metal or some kind of object uh, that you can lay out on the landscape 
um, that snakes just like to hide under. It's actually a really simple technique that can be highly effective if you get these cover boards uh, kind of placed in the right situation. And so you can see that photo on the right there. We've got a bunch of metal cover boards. This is actually old barn siding. We were able to repurpose from some DNR fish and wildlife areas. And we just laid them right along that slough there. And that's actually one of the sloughs I, I showed in that aerial photo there. But we just laid them right along the slough. Not so much in the water, but in areas where it's pretty saturated, areas that get flooded when the, when the creek comes up. And then on that left photo, we actually took um, some metal and we also took some wooden boards. And some of the wooden boards, we, we actually attached uh, carpet foam on the underside of it. This is a technique that's been used by other Kirtland snake researchers with the idea that the carpet foam is pretty absor has a pretty absorbent um, component to it. And so when you lay on the ground, you get a good rain, that foam's soaking up the water. And then as the surrounding landscape starts to dry out, that foam is actually holding in that moisture and it creates this really like hyper moist micro habitat underneath that wooden cover board. So we kind of had a mix of different cover boards that we were trying with the hope that uh, we could really maximize, you know, what we could catch and maybe even get a feel for which cover boards uh, work better than others. Turns out you can kind of get them under everything. So here's an example of a couple of cover board checks. I don't know how well you can see this, but in the left photo, that's a cover board with the carpet foam. And down there kind of below are two Kirtland snakes that we had hanging out underneath of it. It's a little bit tough to see in that image, but they're sitting there on top of the grass. The grass is kind of starting to die out from a lack of sunlight. And uh, that's exactly the sort of thing you hope to see when you flip a cover board going out and doing your sampling. The right photo's got a couple of garter snakes there. Um, for whatever reason, this particular metal cover board produced garter snakes pretty reliably for a while. It's kind of fun when you start to expect them to be there and you lift it up and they're hanging out. You can actually see in between those two arrows, a big old crayfish burrow underneath of that, of that piece of metal there. And so a lot of times we'll try to set cover boards right on top of those crayfish burrows in hopes that, you know, if the snake's down underneath, it can come up out of that burrow and kind of still feel like it's underground, you know, because it's underneath that cover board. But uh, this uh, cover board technique worked uh, pretty darn well out there at, um, at Shine. These images probably won't mean much to you if you're not familiar with the properties, but on the left, um, that's the Shine Nature Preserve, uh, the bottom land area that we surveyed. And those green, it's actually lines of green squares. Those are our cover boards. So I'm just kind of showing how we distributed these cover board arrays around the property. We spaced them about 10 meters apart and we tended to put them in transects of 10 each. And just trying to cover these areas that, that had some uh, intact remaining habitat. A lot of that preserve had been farmed. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but that preserve had been, a lot of it had been farmed up until maybe like two or three years ago. So we were trying to kind of target some of the natural areas of woodland and, and me wet meadow and slough out there. And then in the right photo, we've got Trevlak Bluffs. And then most of those uh, transects there um, are in the kind of the, more of the floodplain area. The bluff itself, you can actually see it's that kind of that dark shaded area. Uh, towards the bottom part of the photo, but the, those are our transects. And we just kind of, we had to get more compressed out there because it was a smaller area. Chris, uh, let me borrow this photo, this aerial photo he took. You can actually see one of our cover board transects just to the left of that fence row that runs north and south there in the photo. There's a little tiny white specks, so a little row of cover boards uh, kind of from the bird's eye view up there. And uh, I just thought that was kind of a cool photo I had to, had to throw in there. So thanks, Chris, for that one. <laughs> cool drone footage there, it looks like. Uh, we didn't really do much turtle trapping last year when our project began, and so we're planning to hit that uh, here in the next next month or two. We're going to try to do some turtle trapping. The traps we use will be similar to the ones you see, probably the same ones as you see in the left photo there, kind of a barrel shape, and they have funnel entrances, and we bait them with sardines, and turtles can come and go freely, but once they get in there, they have a hard time getting out. So we'll go out there, check them. They're live traps. Um, they can come up for air, and so we'll just uh, use that to try to figure out what turtle species are hanging out on site. And I kind of look forward to getting out there and finally getting some turtle trapping in. That was one area we kind of missed on last year. So look forward to seeing what we get. We did get a painted turtle earlier this year and a trap that we set out for salamanders, but uh, didn't have any bait, but they kept going in there for some reason. So pretty effective. Amphibian sampling is some of my favorite stuff to do because my background is a little bit more in amphibians than reptiles, but um, we used a, a variety of approaches to try to figure out which frogs and salamanders were on site. The traditional uh, call survey by ear going out at night or even during the day when frogs are calling is a pretty effective technique. And we worked our way around the preserve there at Shine to see which uh, frogs were on site. Those are all actually photos from the preserve there. And so those are on site uh, amphibians. Um, we actually use these uh, minnow traps or crayfish traps. You see these sometimes in the fishing section at Walmart. They're pretty effective. They've got that funnel opening on either end. So these animals literally just, as they're cruising through the water column, funnel their way into that trap. They have a hard time getting out. And we've got a handful of newts there on the right, you can see. Um, as we were working one of those wetlands out there. So pretty effective technique when the, when the salamanders are in the pond or frogs are in the pond breeding during the spring. 
And then a technique that we found super useful this spring uh, when we went out there was searching for egg masses. And so um, most of our salamanders that we would have on site out there spend their lives on land, but breed in these ponds, these, these seasonal wetlands or even permanent wetlands. And a lot of our, well, actually all of Indiana's frogs uh, lay their eggs in water. And so um, you can actually identify to some extent uh, some of these salamanders and frogs by their eggs, their egg masses. So that large egg mass on the right side there, kind of the bigger photo, that's a wood frog egg mass. Um, the upper right, that's a Jefferson salamander. The lower center one, that's a smallmouth salamander. It takes a little practice to learn these, but you can start to identify species by their egg masses, which is super handy because if these frogs and salamanders come in, they do their thing, they mate, they lay their eggs and they're gone and you miss them, you can, the eggs aren't going anywhere, right? They're just gonna be hanging out there for weeks on end. And if you catch them early on, the water's clear. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of plants growing in them and you can, you can really kind of maximize. That turned out to be a super efficient technique this spring for mapping out which critters are using which wetlands. And I just gotta say, I think like salamander egg masses are so cool. Like I, I see those things in real life, these, these globs. And when you look at them up close, the little egg kind of nested inside, sometimes there's layers of jelly. It's just a super cool thing to see uh, at the end of winter and the beginning of spring as things are starting to warm up and you're getting out there. So I'm gonna present some uh, results. And most of these are actually results from last year. We haven't tallied up all of our results from this year yet, but in this table, these are the results of what we got under our cover boards at Shine, those 10 transects we had out there. Uh, not surprisingly, our most common species of snake that we encountered was uh, a common garter snake. Those are widespread and common in Indiana. But the encouraging thing is having Kirtland snakes be our second most commonly encountered species on that, on that preserve. Now granted, we were targeting them. We did put cover boards in areas where we thought they would occur, but it was, Pretty exciting when we just started pulling them out. And some of those are probably recaptures when we started finding them on different parts of the property um, under these cover boards. And um, that was pretty exciting news for us. And then the decays brown snakes, we got several of those, we got a couple racers. Uh, we did get one lizard, we got a five line skink um, and under one of our cover boards in one of the drier parts of the, of the, uh, the bottoms there where we, had the, where we had them laid out. So that was our one, one single representative lizard of the study so far. And I sure am glad we got that, that one. I got just a few more photos here of some of the, the snakes and uh, the lizard and sort of the reptile slide here. And so um, these racers are, are pretty interesting. They're one of the larger snakes we've seen out there. They're, they can get three or four feet long. They are quite quick. And I think we got a couple on the cover boards. We got one or two sitting out in the open. Um, that garter snake in the top middle was basking on a log right next to our cover board. It didn't really want to go under it, but it was sitting out next to it. So that was a fun one to find. But these are pretty common species that we would expect to find, you know, in South Central Indiana. These aren't really surprises. It's nice when you can confirm their presence, but uh, yeah, it was good. So with the uh, amphibians, here's the results. Uh, this is again from last year's surveys at Shine, the different species that we got. I don't have numbers because sometimes we got these in actually like really large numbers. If you're getting uh, tadpoles, if you're catching um, larvae, you're seeing larvae swimming around the pond, but um, got a pretty good, pretty good assemblage of amphibians out at Shine. There's a pretty good diversity out there. We found just about everything you could expect to find out there in terms of amphibians. We actually got Jefferson salamanders, uh, which are not on this list. We picked those up this spring, and we also got spotted salamander egg masses. Um, and so there's two other salamanders we were able to tack onto here. And yeah, I was, I was really pleased with the species we were getting down there. And wood frogs turned out to be far more common and widespread down on the bottoms than I thought they would be. Um, some of our amphibian photos here, um, those newts in the upper right-hand corner, we started finding those in more wetlands out there. Those, those are a species that spend almost their entire lives in wetlands. Uh, the adults basically stay in there year round. Uh, they do come on land sometimes when they're younger, but uh, that was a, a nice one to pick up. That Jefferson salamander, the bottom middle there was one I, I wasn't quite expecting to find. I tend to find those in upland vernal pools, but that was a, a very pleasant surprise to get a couple of those in a trap. And the marbled salamander in the upper left, that photo of that salamander is actually from Trevlack Bluffs. We got them at both sites, but they, I thought they just had a really striking coloration with those silver cross bands. That's a very attractive salamander we get down here in South Central Indiana. And of course the frogs, I uh, gotta have some frog photos there and uh, picked up a nice little breeding colony of uh, American toads. The gray tree frog, Cope's gray tree frogs in the bottom right, pretty common and widespread out there. What you find when you're out there doing these frog call surveys is that some of these frogs just call in mud puddles. Um, other times, you know, they're using larger wetlands. We try to kind of identify what are the important breeding areas for some of these different species on site. So uh, the wood frog in the upper left-hand corner is a frog that usually does not breed in wetlands that have fish. They're a little bit more picky, and we tend to find those alongside salamanders. Well, we found them all over the place down there this year. We got egg masses. We got them calling. It was really exciting. So I want to talk a little bit about some of our Kirtland snakes observations because this was one of our really our, kind of our biggest target species when we were down there because of its state listing status. 
one of the things we found when we were down there was that um, these snakes uh, certainly are still hanging on in some of these, uh, per, I would call peripheral habitats, wet meadows, kind of open canopy kind of fields um, along some of our little wetland slough areas. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight that, I don't know how well you can see that red boundary on here. That's the boundary of the, the bottoms of the preserve down there. This aerial photo is from around 2015. And the, the, the areas on the map that are kind of that light tan color, those are areas that would have been under cultivation. Those have been had soybeans or corn down planted in the bottoms up until just a few years ago. Um, the places, I don't know if you can see my, can you see my cursor, my little, uh, my little arrow there? I don't know if you can see that or not, but okay. Well, in the upper left-hand portion of that preserve, you can see some areas that are kind of like a, kind of a lighter green color. Those are those open meadows. Those are the areas that were uncultivated and they still contain uh, natural habitat, um, grasslands, some sloughs. And those are the places we're finding Kirtland snakes. Now we didn't really sample the cornfields because it didn't really seem like a, a good place to find them. You know, every year they go when they go through and plow those fields, they're destroying the crayfish burrows that the snakes would be in. Um, they're kind of just disrupting uh, the habitat. But in the areas that are unplowed, these peripheral sites, these snakes have been hanging on for I don't know decades. They've been hanging on for a very long time, centuries. As the habitat changed, they're still hanging on in little pockets of wet prairie. I think that's really important as we consider the site restoration kind of where they've been and where they might occur once we actually get the whole place converted over into a, a more natural habitat. All the sites we got Kirtland snakes on the property were open canopy sort of areas. So like I said, some of the meadows and fields, um, that's not super surprising. They're known to like open habitat or open canopy habitats. Um, they will use bottomland forest. I have seen them in, in fairly dense bottomland forest, but uh, out here um, at Shine, they really, they really seem to prefer that open habitat. We had some darn good wetlands that were in forests where we just couldn't find them. So that does seem to be something they like, a feature they prefer. And um, I, I just think that site restoration, I just wanna kind of reiterate this site restoration, I think is gonna benefit this species and a lot of species out there. Once those old ag fields are uh, converted into kind of a more natural landscape with some of the wetlands and, and sloughs and stuff that they're gonna be putting in out there. And unfortunately, we, we just haven't found Kirtland snakes at Trevlak Bluffs. Um, I was a little surprised. We've got a lot of records for them at nearby Lake Lemon. The habitat looks great. Um, it is heavily forested, but we haven't found them out there yet. Um, we did go out this year and replace all of our wooden cover boards with metal ones. We've kind of tried some new areas. So we're, we're still pushing forward on trying to, to find that species out there. I just keep thinking they've got to be out there. But um, we struck out last year, so we'll see where this year takes us. I've got a little uh, graphic here I wanted to show real quickly that I think highlights what can happen when you restore an agricultural field into something that's natural. These uh, aerial photos are the, basically the exact same thing. Uh, on the left is 2015, on the right is 2019, and those green uh, markers are where we got Kirtland snakes under cover boards out there. If you look at the 2015 aerial on the left, what you'll see is that site where we got Kirtland snakes was under cultivation, like, you know, in 2015, you know, seven years ago, that thing was being plowed up. And at some point between 2015 and 2019, they just stopped plowing that area, probably because it was too wet. If you look at that left photo, you can see that's a, the, the soil is just darker there. I think it's a really saturated area and the water probably pulls up there during a flood event and they just quit plowing it. And here we come along in 2021 and we start finding Kirtland snakes there. And I, I think, I can't say for sure, but I think this is pretty good evidence that of what happens when you take an agricultural field and just kind of let it become a natural sort of place. It's, it's revegetated with sedges and grasses and all of a sudden state endangered Kirtland snakes appear to have colonized it. Crayfish burrows are intact. And when I noticed this on Google Earth, just by flipping through time, I thought, wow, this is a really cool illustration of what can happen when you convert like, you know, a, a tilled landscape into a more natural habitat. And, and I'm excited that, that that's what's gonna happen to this whole place. You know, they haven't really farmed down there for a year or two, but we're looking at this whole preserve, the areas that were cultivated becoming more natural. And I'm hoping that that means we're going to see these snakes and a lot of other critters kind of colonizing and moving into these areas and making, making their homes. And I think we can expect that. So we'll talk about uh, real quickly here, next steps. We plan to continue our sampling at Shine this year. We started last year. We're going to try to do our, the rest of our frog. We're pretty much done with our frog surveys out there, but definitely want to try to target turtles over the next six weeks. I'm hoping to actually wrap up all of our, our herb sampling at Shine uh, by July 1. And, uh, and we'll kind of kind of call it, call it done at that point. 
we've actually got some cover boards out there that Chris has continued to monitoring to monitor. We've kind of passed those over to him. And so he's taken over. Chris and Ellen have been out there checking those and they're keeping notes on what they've seen, but we're shifting over to turtles and frogs this year. And I think we're going to wrap it up in July. Uh, we do plan to continue our surveys at uh, Trevlight Bluffs for the rest of the year. We've got those new cover boards out there and hoping to see if we get any Kirtland snakes. We're continuing to find some new critters out there that we had not found before during our surveys. So it's nice to get confirmation. Uh, they do have spotted salamanders and marbled salamanders out there, almost certainly smallmouth salamanders, although I haven't seen them. And so there's definitely some cool stuff going on out there too. And I, I think I've talked with Chris about this a little bit. I've thought more about, you know, are there other parts of the Bean Blossom Valley that we could be sampling, other Sycamore Land Trust preserves that we can continue to sample to make this kind of more than just a property specific survey, but actually almost like a watershed or a stream valley survey, like what's going on in the Bean Blossom Creek Valley overall. And I think that would be cool. I always have to kind of consider the ambitions and my also my abilities to do it because I've got a lot of other projects going on right now and I tend to get pretty ambitious about these projects. But um, that's something that's on my radar and we'll have to kind of have some more discussions moving forward to see if there's other opportunities. One of the opportunities that we uh, started this year that, that uh, Chris mentioned was a new uh, herpetological survey at Touch the Earth Natural Area over in Bartholomew County. We have enlisted the passions and skills of a local high schooler who is even more lit up on amphibians and reptiles than I was at his age and he's pretty good at finding stuff and we had him uh, we have him enlisted as an official volunteer for the DNR and he's kind of working under the oversight of Chris and myself and he had some pretty good finds in, a, in one of the ponds out there we didn't know what to expect and he pulled out several species of salamander and frogs out of this little pond it's the main wetland on site and it's small but it's got stuff and then just recently he found a black king snake which is not rare in southern Indiana but where he found it is right on the northern edge of where they're known to occur in Indiana so that was a pretty good record for that area there so He's making headway. We're getting data from that preserve that we didn't have before. And I'm hoping that this is a good experience for him professionally as he kind of thinks about college and wants to potentially move into a career um, in herpetology. If he chooses to do that, I'm hoping an opportunity like this is, is a way to kind of invest in him. I, I, it feels good to kind of invest in someone who you know shares a similar passion that you do with this kind of stuff. So <clears throat> a few concluding thoughts here as we uh, wrap this up. I do think Shine Nature Preserves has a, a pretty good diverse array of herptofauna on site and uh, including these state endangered Kirtland snakes. That was the keystone species that we found out there. Um, they have a, a pretty darn good diversity of amphibians with several frogs and salamanders. That was great to find. Um, and I just want to reiterate that I, I do think the Bean Blossom Creek Valley is this kind of distinct feature, habitat feature, a habitat corridor of wetland, moist soil habitat that runs through this hill country. And I think it's great that sycamores out there uh, pr protecting land, acquiring these properties, preserving them. And uh, I just I just have to give a, a shout out to Sycamore and everything they're doing. They have been great to work with. I have very much appreciated the support of Sycamore uh, when it comes to these non-game and endangered species. I recognize that amphibians and reptiles is not everyone's bread and butter. That's my bread and butter. And, not, and some people are totally weirded out by them, but working with Chris and Alan and everybody over there has just been awesome. And I really appreciate that that's a priority for Sycamore is uh, getting in there and restoring these properties and, and these non-game and endangered species that maybe don't always receive as much attention that Sycamore says, hey, this is a big deal to us and we wanna incorporate that. So thank you so much for what you're doing. You're fighting, you're fighting the good fight on this front and I have really enjoyed the collaboration and I look forward to more uh, as we move down the road. I have one more slide here. I just have to give a shout out to my own agency because uh, what pays my bill, what pays my salary, what pays for this work to be done on the DNR side our donations to the non-game wildlife fund. Some of you may have heard of that. Some of you may already give. Um, anyone who gives five dollars to the non-game wildlife fund, uh, the federal, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal government will actually match it with nine. That's what basically drives my program. Um, some of our other non-game and endangered species programs with mammals and birds. Most of us are driven by this. We have some other uh, smaller grants, but this is really what drives that whole program for the DNR. And so um, I just got to give a shout out to that because it is what pays my salary and allows me to be here tonight. So. Uh, thank you for anyone who has actually donated to that. That's that's a big deal. And some of you may have seen on our website, we've been featuring, this is the 40, 40th anniversary, 40 year anniversary of the Non-Game Wildlife Fund. And so we're, we pulled together this 40 stories kind of project talking about 40 different types of stories that's come out of the last 40 years of the Non-Game Wildlife Fund and some of these different programs. So you can probably get some information on the Division of Fish and Wildlife's website or on our Facebook page. And I can send, I can send you guys, Kate or Chris, I can send you information on that if you, if, you know, your supporters are interested in that. That's kind of an ongoing thing we're doing throughout the year is highlighting some of the stuff and you'll see some amphibian reptile stuff in there. I think other than that, that wraps me up. I'm right at the 30 minute mark, which is good. Um, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Thank you, Sycamore, for being such great partners. By the way, that photo was taken at the Shine Foundation Nature Preserve on a warm summer day with some humidity that made some really cool rays of sunlight. So thanks for the work you're doing out there.
Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Nate. Um, and Chris and I can definitely tell you being out at Shine the past couple of days with lots of humidity, checking all those cover boards <laughs> is beautiful and it's really sweaty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but thank you again. I mean, you talked about how much collaboration and partnership means to you from the DNR perspective, but from Sycamore, like we so appreciate the partnership that we have with you and with the DNR. I mean, you getting out there and looking at and finding all these different species, we can restore the land, but without knowing the species that we're protecting with it, it just shows how much of the work is worth it. And I think you will see the fruits of our labor and the progress that we're making with land conservation and restoration. Um, so we're totally open for questions. If you have a question, feel free to drop it into the chat or this is a conservation conversation. So if you'd like to feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, or if you want, uh, you can turn your camera on and ask uh, whatever feels best for you. Hey, Nate, um, I'm going to start. Sorry, Ellen. Uh, I'm going to start with a question. Uh, well, first, I, I want a comment and a question. The comment is um, uh, the partnership. It, it, we are so thankful, as Ellen said, to have the partnership with you. And, and you know, we've been partnering with DNR for a long time, but to get research on the ground, for me, uh, coming from Kind of a background in field research uh, and then getting into stewardship. One of the things I was just talking about this in a meeting today is that, um, you know, and, and you may have experienced this too, Nate, you know, when you're going through getting your, your degree, undergrad, graduate degree, and, and you're so involved in the science, it's so exciting, but then you, you there's this moment often time that happens is you feel there's a disconnect between the academic world and the, the people that are doing the making the decisions on the ground, the boots on the ground side. And so, and when I came here, I, I wanted to bring, try to find a way to meld that, you know, is, is and bring that together in the, because as a steward, I, I'm, I'm still learning always. And I, and I want to make sure, you know, when we do any type of stewardship work, whether we do nothing or we do something, there's winners and losers. And so I'm always thinking, how can I maximize the species that are going to win from what we're doing? and minimize the species that are going to be hurt by that. And, and I need to rely on people smarter than me, which doesn't, it isn't hard. And so I need to, to reach out to experts, you know, in the field, you know, whether it's, it's forestry or, you know, it's her herbs, you know? So um, that's why it's been so exciting to have you there. And it has already started to guide our, our work, even though we haven't done any work officially at Shine, we're in the process of planning this major restoration there. And that has already, you've been in meetings with me, with the NRCS and it's already changing some of the plans we had in mind because we realized there's curling snakes in this area and we want to minimize negatively impacting them and we just want to help them grow so uh, that's been a big bonus for for what we've done there it was really just the baseline to know what we have so we could compare to what we have after we do it but in the process we've learned hey we need to take some steps uh, precautions in making this happen that we don't cause some damage so uh, I want to just let people know that this isn't just about finding, you know, just something fun to find out what's going on out there. It's really guiding what we do here at Sycamore. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, I agree, Chris. I mean, I, I actually don't get involved in a lot of projects, not because I don't want to, just the opportunity has presented itself to get involved in all projects where we're collecting this amphibian and reptile data on the front end before there's a big restoration project. And so it's cool to think that yeah, some of those places we found those Kirtland snakes. Now we're working through, okay, we were gonna, you know, we're trying to do some wetland restoration on there. How do we do that without impacting them? We know the final product of getting that place restored is gonna be better for all the herbs and a lot of wildlife. This isn't just about herbs, but a lot of wildlife, but we now, now that we have the information, we have the knowledge about where these things occur, we're able to make more informed decisions about how to get from point A to point B with not, without causing too much damage to the population. And so, yeah, it's been cool. I mean, it's been good to be on this end too, to be able to be a part of these conversations. I really, I know it sounds cliche, but I'm, I'm a big believer in that we can accomplish so much more if we work together. I really think these collaborations are key. I think they're critical because even though the Division of Fish and Wildlife has been commissioned to oversee the management of the state's amphibians, we just can't do it on our own. We have to partner with people. We have to partner with organizations like Sycamore or Niches or TNC to say, you know, how can we, how can we work together to do this? It sounds a little cliche, but I'm a huge believer. And I, I hope that what we're seeing tonight is kind of the fruit of that, so. Yeah. And can you speak, I mean, you kind of did, but maybe, you know, people might be interested, like, why should we care about herps and why, yeah. you know, I mean, other than because they're cool, you know, right. I mean, like, 
as far as indicator species and uh you know because there's a lot of people say well you know i don't like seeing snakes you know and then um or you know you know everybody likes turtles right i mean but yeah. not everybody likes snakes and frogs and salamanders but uh you know and, and then with things that they're facing like chytrid and snake fungal disease and you know climate change all things snakes are you know the canaries of the coal mine and of for wetlands and stuff so you know maybe just touch on that a little bit so sure. why, why we're making such a big deal about this yeah well i mean i'm always gonna make a big deal about herps just because i like them so much but you're right i mean that's that's a, like a multi that question has like a multifaceted answer because you know as we start to understand ecosystems and how they work I mean, I, I kind of think of like an ecosystem as like an orchestra and, you know, and you've got all these different components, all these different instruments. And so it's like, you know, how, can you lose a violin here? Can you use a trumpet there? I mean, you can start to lose some, but after a while, you lose so many instruments, you lose so many species, you don't even recognize the sound of the music anymore. And I really think that like ecologically, that's, that sounds kind of artsy, but I think ecologically, there really is this, this healthy functioning ecosystem that has all of these components that are still intact, you know, frogs, tadpoles. I mean, they're pretty low on the food chain. So they provide a lot of food for higher level predators, whether it be, you know, a sandhill crane, I don't know if cranes, but like a great blue heron waiting around in the, in the slough or a mink or a snake itself, you know, and, and so they, they kind of provide food for a lot of animals and uh, they themselves eat a lot of animals. I mean, salamander larvae eat mosquito larvae. I mean, who doesn't, <laughs> who doesn't like salamanders now? So it's like, you know, we see, we see that each have their own role, they each have kind of like their own um, instrument in an orchestra, they each have their own role in keeping this ecosystem healthy. Um, and also, I, I guess I approach this, this might be a little more philosophical, but I, I look at these animals and it's not just herbs, it's, you know, it's any of our state's wildlife or plants or even geological features as part of what I would, con what I would call our state's natural heritage. This is simply a part of what makes Indiana, Indiana from a natural resources standpoint. Yeah, snakes are kind of in the corner over there, but they're a part of that. And I just, I see that as part of the heritage that we've inherited and something that I believe that, I, I personally think we have kind of a moral compulsion to properly manage this so that it's present for people to enjoy now and in the future. There's other things you can look at like uh, snake venom or I was reading recently about Gila monster, it's a lizard venom being used biomedically, you know? And so we're, we're discovering that some of these sort of more undesirable animals actually can provide benefits from hu to humans. I personally think even beyond that, it behooves us to try to conserve them, not just for the health of the ecosystem, but it's just a part of what makes Indiana, Indiana. And uh, you just never know what you're gonna discover. You never know what kind of interesting component of these animals we may find down the road scientifically or, or its role in the ecosystem. Uh, but um, I think there's a lot more to learn on that front. Every cog in a wheel, right? That's what it we're... is. I mean, I think gears in a watch, you know, there's like how many can you remove before things start breaking down? And, and and like to your point, amphibians are facing a lot of conservation challenges. We talk about habitat loss, we talk about disease. Chytrid fungus has affected a lot of amphibians globally. Doesn't seem to be too brutal in the Midwest. I think they've actually started to live with it. Maybe a wave came through decades ago. It's hard to say. Uh, snake fungal disease is an emerging pathogen affecting snakes. There's a new a newer turtle disease that's affecting turtle, like their shells start to rot. I haven't, we haven't seen that um, down in the, in the bean blossom bottoms. I'm not sure we've actually got any records for Indiana yet, but um, these are always things that we're dealing with, almost like an invasive species. We're always having these new battles, kind of new fronts pop up. And so um, the more we can manage healthy ecosystems, though, hopefully these populations can be robust enough to, to withstand an assault from a disease, you know, or from, you know, the loss of a wetland here or there. Yeah, Nate, with all of those conservation concerns in mind, is there anything that, you know, an individual can do um, hmm. either through citizen science or through their own like management of their landscape at home to promote the conservation of, uh, of herps? Yeah, I mean, since a lot of our amphibians and reptiles use wetlands and especially our amphibians, they have to have a wetland to complete that tadpole cycle, to complete that larval cycle. You know, if you have a seasonal wetland on your property, I know that those can be sources of mosquitoes, but again, if you have a healthy population with uh, salamanders, <laughs> it may help with that. Yeah, to have a little nondescript sort of thing like that um, on your property can be critical for a population, a local population of amphibians. So I know some people may want to drain that. I, I'm guessing most people in this in this meeting probably would not want to do that. But like, you know, there may be reasons to do that. But like, I think even preserving the, I guess my point would be even preserving the smaller kind of nondescript components of habitat can make a difference. Um, one of the things I sometimes recommend to people, this isn't necessarily a habitat management issue, but there are various citizen science sort of platforms for reporting your observations. So iNaturalist, a lot of you probably heard of, um, that's a popular way to say, oh, I found a, 
a Kirtland snake or I found a wood frog and you can go in and kind of enter that record or a photograph of it into that platform. The big one that I follow is called Herp Mapper, herpmapper.com. And it's a, it's a citizen science platform that's dedicated um, a lot of like sort of people who are active like me out looking for amphibians and reptiles will take photos and record uh, their observations in there. I actually have administrative access to all the Indiana records. So if you like enter that into that database, I can go in and see what people are finding. And that's super helpful because people will report finding things like Kirtland snakes or a Blanding's turtle or other endangered species. And that just simply knowing where things exist is like one of the most important things, like first steps in this whole process of conservation. Thank you. I see the Herp Mapper link there. Thanks, Alan. So there's things, there's ways to contribute like that. And by the way, if you ever have like a question about like, oh, I found a snake in my yard, I'm kind of concerned, is it a copperhead or whatever? You can always just email me. Um, I can, I don't know, I guess I can punch my email uh, into the, the feed there, but you can always just email me if you've got a photo of it. I'm happy to look at that. I do that stuff throughout the spring and summer actually, so. So Nate, while we got people here, um, how many venomous snakes are in Indiana? You know, and um, what are the odds of somebody encountering one? I mean, maybe just share it with people. Uh, sure. I think we have a, a pretty knowledgeable group here, but I think it's worth talking about because it's it's kind of a hot topic. And and when's your next aerial drop of them? You know, I just I just want to be aware of that so I can put my helmet on. Okay. Yeah. You might so want we're to not we're not that, that urban legend. Yeah, we're not doing any aerial drops. I don't think we've ever done anything like that. No black helicopter, special ops, rattlesnake drops. That's not really part of our scheme. Uh, but uh, we have four venomous snakes in Indiana on paper. Timber rattlesnakes uh, down here in south central Indiana. Copperheads, mostly in southern Indiana. Uh, up in northern Indiana, we have the eastern Massasauga. Um, and then the cottonmouth or water moccasin was historically known from the state. We haven't had any reliable records in about two decades or more from those. They're only known from one or two spots. So uh, the whole water moccasin cottonmouth thing, they may, may well be gone from the state. We don't know for sure. They may be now extirpated. But in our region down here, copperheads would be the most common. Timber rattlesnakes are around. If you go over to Yellowwood or Morgan Monroe or Brown County, you could encounter one. Odds aren't great. Um, in the last five years or so that I've been working here for, for the DNR in my current capacity, I have not come across a copperhead or a timber rattlesnake just by chance. But I've been in some pretty good looking places for copperheads. Um, but they do show up from time to time. So I would say your odds are not good or not great for coming across, randomly coming across um, a venomous snake. Three out of the four I just mentioned are listed as state endangered, so they're pretty rare. Uh, copperheads would be the most common. And, and down here in Southern Indiana, it's copperheads and timber rattlesnakes. Um, those are almost in forested habitats. That's why we've still got them. There's a lot of dense forested habitat uh, in this part of the, the state. So um, probably not a huge risk, but you know something to be aware of when you're out there. And um, if it's, there's some really interesting statistics. If you look at the CDC's website about venomous snake bites, I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 8,000 venomous snake bites a year uh, across the US, um, but maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five deaths. I mean, even if you get bit, the odds of, of surviving are, are pretty good if you can get medical attention right away. So you need to throw that out there because that is something that is a big concern. You can die from a rattlesnake bite, but the odds of even encountering one are, are not great. Hey, can I uh, jump in here? Sure. All right, thanks. Hey, thanks so much, Nate. Uh, really appreciate uh, everything you've done and everything that uh, our partners uh, with DNR do with Sycamore. It's it's an incredible collaboration. Um, I just want to fill in really fast. Chris made a, a joke there that may not everyone would get, but there's, there is an honest to goodness, long standing uh, urban myth that the DNR uh, dropped timber rattlesnakes from helicopters or airplanes to repopulate Southern <laughs> Indiana. And that was, that, he was joking about that. But I just, I just want everyone out there to know that there's a, there is a real, a real ongoing urban myth that that really happened and that didn't happen. Can you confirm that Nate? Yeah, I can confirm. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, it didn't happen as far, definitely not the airplane helicopter thing. That's not a very good idea from an animal welfare standpoint, but no, to my knowledge, I'm, I'm just being completely honest to my knowledge there has not been any, any rattlesnake introductions or releases in the state 
What there has been though, has been some research on timber rattlesnakes locally down here in some of our state forests and in Brown County State Park. And in those situations, what happens is a lot of times researchers will go out, they'll find a rattlesnake, they'll catch it, they'll take it back to the office or to, a, uh, to maybe a lab and a vet, in some of these instances, a veterinarian will surgically implant a radio tracking device into the snake, a radio transmitter into it. Then they take it back out and they release it where they found it so they can track its movements. And I can, I can envision a situation where somebody you know, sees a couple of DNR guys taking one of these snakes or actually Purdue's been pretty involved with this as well, these research projects, but releasing it back where you found it, being like, oh my gosh, I knew it was true. There it is. I've got, you know, that's, that's a different situation. That's just researching an animal and putting it back where you found it so you can track its movements. But I mean, these rattlesnakes are an, a natural part of the Southern Indiana landscape. Um, they're not particularly common but they do hang on where there's still habitat. And so um, we, it, it's a, you know, you have to kind of walk the line because we, we're definitely concerned with public safety, but we are also concerned about keeping healthy populations of our rattlesnakes. And so, um, like I said, there's not a huge chance of even encountering one um, unless you're really out looking for it. Or sometimes if you're walking through like Brown County State Park, but um, they're actually a very docile species. I've, I've worked with timber rattlesnakes in the past. Some of them don't even rattle until you start to lift them with the snake hook. They're really laid back and chill for the most part. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's, but that is a, that is just a never ending urban legend. Maybe it's a rural legend since it's down in the countryside, but like, it's just never ending. And, uh, and it just, you know, these, these sort of rumors and these things spread like wildfire through, you know, internet chat rooms and whatever else. And so, uh, but we don't have anything like that going on. And I, I don't know of anything that ever has gone on on that front, but we do try to manage them well if we can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I just, I just share that because right. there's this myth of, they're just everywhere and the DNR is dropping them from the sky and that's not the truth. And, you know, uh, some people might think it's weird, but I wish I have, had seen a timber rattlesnake because that's a really cool endangered species. Yeah. I've been working for Sycamore for 16 years now and walking around out in the woods for longer than that. Never seen one. The I think I've seen two copperheads in my life. One was in a wood pile at my friend's house out in the woods, and the other one was in a wood pile next to our Sycamore Land Trust office. So, yeah, people, you, you know, you want to be safe and keep an eye out and don't <coughs> mess with any wildlife and, and know your snakes, but it, the I think that uh, the idea that going out into the woods is a significant risk of being bit by a venomous snake is just not true. And I, I just, you know, hope people understand that, um, you know, be safe, be careful, keep your eye out. But boy, if you if you see one of the snakes, you're doing a lot better than I, I have been. And I'm looking for them because I just think it'd be cool to see them. So yeah, yeah I know guys that go out, they want to look for them. They want to find them because they just think these snakes are cool and they, they have a hard time finding them sometimes. And, and are, if you're on a trail, yeah. yeah, if you're walking on a trail, you can see the ground. That's helpful. I mean, if you're off the trail, if it's warm season, you're stepping over a log, you might want to look over the log before you step. They'll sometimes lay alongside logs to feed to intercept the chipmunk or a squirrel that's running along it. But yeah, just, you know, smart things like that. But like I said, I, I get into the woods a lot. I get into some pretty rugged areas, you know, between here and the Ohio River where I think, man, why am I not ever finding copperheads? And honestly, I'm probably walking by some of them. <laughs> I really am because they blend in pretty well with leaf litter. But yeah, just try to use common sense awareness when you're out in the field. And honestly, your risk is probably greater with ticks than it is with timber rattlesnakes or copperheads. It is. I, you know what? And I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, boy, uh, Rob on our staff, I, I, I believe Ellen too. Uh, no, and um, I can think of a couple of volunteers all have gotten tick-borne uh, diseases. Uh, mm. Lyme disease, the alpha gall um, allergy where you get a tick bite and then you are allergic to red meat for the rest of your life. I, yeah, I, I know at least six people off the top of my head who've gotten that, maybe more. Uh, Kay uh, Yaskovich, um, uh, you know, the Indio Wildflower book, um, almost died of a tick-borne encephalitis. Um, 
but I can't think of anyone that I know that has had a poisonous snake bite. So not that that isn't a thing. Be careful, but, you know, be realistic. Yeah, ticks are a much, much higher risk in my experience. And I, I bet the stats bear that out. So, yeah. Yeah, it destigmatize their local snake populations. Exactly. Say that again. Exactly. Destigmatize, destigmatize their local state populations. Yeah. Harbor mm -hmm. distaste for yeah. ticks. Yeah. You know, quite, comment, yeah. I was going to say this is an interesting kind of cross examination here, but like there was actually a study that they, they projected. This was interesting. They did some modeling. And they estimated how many, you know, how many ticks tend to be on squirrels and how many squirrels get eaten by timber rattlesnakes. And they're actually looking at timber rattlesnakes as a possible means of reducing Lyme disease because of how many tick bearing mammals they eat. Now, I don't know if they actually had the hard data, but they were modeling it out, just some estimates. And it's like, oh, I never really thought about that. You know, it makes sense. These snakes are eating small mammals that carry a lot of these ticks around. So uh, thank your local neighborhood snake if you get a, ch get a chance there. Exactly. And and, and then I'll, I'll get off the subject because I'm, I'm getting kind of uh, off, off track, but um, there was a, a study, I, you know, we could find it that uh, uh, Japanese barberry, you know, a, you know, it's a popular, uh, uh, you know, uh, decorative plant, but unfortunately, you know, non-native and invasive in natural areas. And we spent uh, time and money uh, controlling it, especially at Trap Black Bluffs, which is a state decade nature preserve and a really nice natural area. And that there's, you know, they, they found a correlation with, uh, you know, populations of, uh, you know, barberry and tick populations. It's good tick habitat, huh. which is not good for people or, you know, probably, you know, any other mammal you know, I mean, they're the ticks are kind of, but yeah. So let's let's worry about the things that are real that are scientifically shown to cause problems, and let's leave the snakes alone because they're awesome and cool and not <laughs> causing the same kind of problems as ticks or even the barberry that promotes ticks. So. Very true. And Ann Connors, our development director, has a good uh, public service announcement for everyone that it's good, especially around this time of year when ticks are already becoming super heavy. It's really good to wear protective insect repellent clothes when you're in the woods and gardening. Tuck your pants into your socks, tuck your shirt into your pants. Um, very important around this time of year and until September, October season when the last seed ticks are gone. Um, and then, but around the subject of timber rattlesnakes, Chris and I have been fortunate enough to have a timber rattlesnake encounter. encounter. We were very lazy about it. We didn't do anything. We just drove past one. <laughs> it was on um, one of the roads through Brown County. We cut through there when coming back from field work uh, oh. near Columbus. So mm. it was a little on the way back to the office treat we got and it was, it was massive but it was just moseying across the road. Um, and we had to kind of inform another passerby um, who was, I think we think from out of town that no, he should not run over the snake, um, but instead please go around it. And this is actually a state endangered rattlesnake. It's really cool. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Environmental education never stops. Yeah. Uh, Mary, well, speaking of environmental education, our environmental education director, Mary Wells, uh, asked, do you recommend and or use the citizen, the citizen science data through Frog Watch USA? You know, Mary, thanks for asking that. I, I actually haven't really looked at the Frog Watch USA uh, data that they've got. You know, back about five or so, maybe six or seven years ago, up until six or seven years ago, the DNR had this uh, NAMP volunteer frog calls like North American Amphibian Monitoring Program. It's actually a federal program. I think it was through the U.S. Geological Survey. And then each state had kind of these state partners. And we had that from, gosh, the early 2000s up until I think that 15 years of data up until about 2015. 
funding dried up and that whole thing went away. So we don't have that with DNR anymore. We don't really have like a program for that, but I know Frog Watch kind of lives on as a separate program. I think it's maybe through the American Zoological Society or Association of Zoos and Aquariums. It's it maybe an AZA thing, I'm not sure, but um, I don't really have access to their data. I'm not sure how that works with Frog Watch. I say, if you want to do it, go for it because we don't really have anything else you know, in Indiana that's uh, formalized. Um, when we go out and do our frog call surveys, a lot of it depends on the species we're looking for. We tend to use the, pro the five minute listening protocol that the North American Amphibian Monitoring Program used to use when they were in existence. And in fact, just last night, I was down in kind of the White River area down around Davies and Knox counties doing some surveys. And so we kind of use some of those protocols, but we don't really enter anything into Frog Watch. That's just, that's kind of a separate deal. But I say go for it if you're interested or if, you, if you've been doing it. And uh, I, I guess I could reach out to those guys and see you know, what, what data has been collected if they're, if they're willing to share it with kind of state partners and stuff. Cause it, it is helpful to kind of know, you just never know when something kind of rare and interesting is going to pop up or if something common starts to disappear. Yeah, that's really good to know. <clears throat> so Nate, tough question. Uh, favorite <laughs> herb. And it can't be crawfish frog. Cause we know you did your grad work on that. All right. Um, so my, my favorite Indiana herp, I actually have a photo of it in one of my first slides, is actually, it's called the lesser siren. It's a lesser siren. It's an aquatic salamander. And we have them in southwest Indiana. It's one that I've wondered if we might pick it up down at Shine and some of those bottoms. It's known from Goose Pond down towards the Evansville area. Mm -hmm. And there's a pocket of them up, up in northwest Indiana, kind of near the Kankakee, the old Kankakee Marsh region. And it's a, just a wild looking creature, man. It looks like an eel. It's got two front legs, no back legs. It's got these feathery gills on its head, kind of like a mud puppy has. And um, they're just so interesting. I've, I've caught a few of them and they're just so cool to watch. They're slender. They can get up to about 18 inches long, probably a foot is more typical. And um, they have this really cool ability. They'll, they'll, they live in kind of wetlands and ditches and sloughs, maybe the weedy backwaters of lakes. But if the wetland they're in, dries up they can kind of go down into like a, a burrow or a hole and they can form an actual like kind of cocoon almost a capsule with their skin and the wetland can completely dry up and they'll just be hanging out in that little capsule for weeks perhaps even months at a time until that wetland fills back up and you get a rain event and then they sort of come out of it and i guess resume life as normal it's something it sounds so exotic but it is something we definitely have here in indiana and so, probably more so the southwest uh portion of the state kind of kind of west of the hill country as you start to get into Greene County and Davies County down some of those bottomlands. And they are just a super cool animal. So yes, that's my, I would probably put that as my favorite. It's changed over the years. Crawfish frogs are up there, but that's probably <laughs> my favorite creature. I, I hardly ever get to see them, but they are definitely lurking in the, in these sort of obscure places on the Southern Indiana landscape. What was the name again? So I can be it, sure to look it up. It's the lesser siren. The, uh, the sub, the type, the subspecies we have in Indiana is the Western lesser siren. And actually, I'm going to type in, I'll take a website in here that might be helpful for anybody who is actually interested in amphibians and reptiles. It's, uh, there's a, let me see, hold up my, there's a website called the Indiana Herp Atlas, the Indiana Herp or Herpetology Atlas. Um, I don't think you put it in here yet, Ellen. I'm going to beat you to it. If I can. That a friend of mine helped co-create. It's a really good resource for amphibian and reptile information in the state. If you want to kind of learn more about their biology, their life history, and it's chock full of really nice photographs. Guys who take photographs better than I can take. I aspire to take photos like they do. Uh, it has photos of every single species of our 95 species in Indiana. And it, actually, it has maps. The maps need to be updated, but it has a nice uh, account of the lesser siren. It has some cool photos and stuff. But it, it's a very good resource that a lot of times if someone reaches out to me and they're asking about an animal, I'll refer them to the Indiana Herp Atlas. I wish our DNR website was as, as good as this one when it comes to the herpetology page. That's on me to get updated, but uh, it's a really good resource. So maybe uh, put that, definitely save that one in your favorites and visit it frequently. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and you're being modest. You take really good photographs, but- um, I appreciate it. I, I do try to always get better. Um, you, you, that, that's very fascinating about the siren, how it kind of, finds a way to, to, to survive those dry periods. Uh, and that just made me think of a, something I'm kind of curious about, maybe some of the people that have decided to hang on with us, which is great. Um, like how, what is this, I, I, in general, because each species is slightly different, but in general, how do herps survive, you know, 
not only the dry times, but like the winter, you know, they don't, yeah. they don't yeah. technically hibernate the way we think of hibernation. And it's, it's quite fascinating. And, and obviously there's difference between different species, but you know, I mean, could you touch on that real simply in a kind of a basic terms? Yep, yep. So um, in the winter, a lot of our frogs and salamanders, they just go underground or they kind of burrow down into the leaf litter. A lot of our salamanders live underground anyway. So I don't even know how dormant they would get. Uh, but some of our frogs that are active on the surface during the warm period of year, they just kind of go down in the leaf litter. Some of them are on the bottoms of ponds and wetlands. They'll just be underwater and their heart rate is so slow and, and they can just actually handle being under the ice even. And turtles are similar too. a lot of, I mean, actually our box turtle will probably be the main exception. Uh, a lot of our turtles hibernate, most of our turtles hibernate or, or go dormant to use, I guess, a less technical term because it's probably not true hibernation um, under the water. They just go down into the mud and they just kind of, and, and the whole, the whole, um, Physiology slows down and um, yeah, they can just kind of go dormant. Although you'll have sometimes in December where you have a sunny day, 60 degrees in December and you see a turtle basking on a log. So they can kind of come out when the water warms up. What's amazing about Southern Indiana, and I grew up in the far Northern end of the state back when winters were a little bit more well-defined. And down here in Southern Indiana, you can actually go out and find a salamander any month of the year if you want to. Um, if you get into a place like a spring where the water flows more continuously and it's warm, it's like, well, relatively speaking, 50 degrees or whatever, you can find salamanders around springs. Um, you can find them on warm days in December, sometimes on warm days in January when it's rainy, like 50 or 60 degrees and raining. A lot of salamanders migrate to breeding ponds, start laying their eggs as early as January, even December. Well, this past December, we actually had documented breeding, spring breeding salamanders breeding in December. So I think the dormancy thing for a lot of these critters isn't quite so cut and dry. You know, a lot of it's weather dependent when you're cold blooded, when your body responds more, um, uh, or, or I guess kind of keeps its temperature more in line with the weather. Uh, they'll come out when it's warm, even, even in months where it seems like they should be dormant. Oh, and I didn't say snakes. A lot of times snakes will go into underground den. You know, you hear about snake dens, timber rattlesnakes, garter snakes. It may be um, um, a riprap area of rock under a bridge. It could just be like an opening in a hole in the side of a hill. Sometimes you wouldn't even, a lot of times you wouldn't even know there's a den there, but most of these animals just go underground. So the Indiana Jones things could happen. You could fall in a pit full of snakes. <laughs> probably, yeah, technically, I suppose you probably could. Okay. You, not Most people aren't that lucky. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> True herpetologist speaking there. Uh, Feeling lucky falling in a pit full of snakes. Yeah, as long as they're not venomous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want to say for anyone who has not had the privilege and honor of being in the field with a herpetologist like Nate or Jason, it is truly an experience. Um, I highly recommend if you're ever with a herp nerd, uh, just take a walk with them because they will dive out of a moving vehicle and begin crawling on the ground because they spotted something moving through the grass. Um, yeah. Honestly, like one of top 10 experiences on the stew crew here at Sycamore was uh, being able to go out and do this cover board surveys with you and Jason. It was so much fun. I'm glad you enjoyed that. You know, it's fun, you know, showing people this stuff. You can tell that I enjoy talking about it. I, I just think these animals are so cool. I just think they're so interesting and I'm super privileged to be able to work in this position where I get to work with them full time. A lot of work I do is behind a desk, but you know, getting out and seeing these things, mapping out where they occur, understanding more about the habitats they're using, um, it's just, it's a super blessing in my life and I, I enjoy getting out and doing that stuff. And it's, it's just fun bringing other people kind of into that experience because a lot of these animals are pretty secretive. Like you don't necessarily see salamanders unless you're looking for them. So to introduce that to people who don't even know these things exist on the Indiana landscape is, is a real privilege. That's great. Well, and that kind of, yeah, Chris, do you have another question? Cause I'm going to do the classic two ending question. Oh, Okay, that's that's that. I like that. I like that. Well, I was just going to uh, echo that that it, it that well, I was going to say that your, your passion for it shows, and that's why it is so exciting to work with you. And that, that was why I wanted to have you on because, um, you know, most people that are in the conservation field are pretty passionate about what they do. You know, we're not doing it to get rich and famous. We're doing it because we care about it, and um, that's why you know you you put in the hard days, but you know, we're pretty lucky to get to do what we do and also because we get to see some wonderful things and, and know that we're making a difference and you know it's great to work with somebody like you because you're making such a difference and we're glad to partner with you and and you know I think the DNR I think for some people they just see it as a part 
you know, a park system and it's so much more than that. And, um, and that's why, you know, giving you got you a chance, a platform to talk about how important the non-game side of it is and how, you know, that it, it takes a lot to do what you do physically and it takes funding to do that. And so we want to, uh, we want to support that also. It's not just you supporting us, it's us supporting you. So thanks so yeah. much for what you do. And um, it's been a wonderful working with you and, and I know we will continue to do this. Um, we've got lots of things in store in the future and I'm making a list of other things to, to talk to you about. So right. you're, <laughs> you got job security, Nate. We're going to keep nice. you busy. Um, <laughs> but I will I will turn that o the baton over to Ellen to finish uh, with the final two questions in, in yes. All right. fashion here. Um, yeah. And this is, if anyone's familiar with the podcast Ologies hosted by Ali Ward, it's a wonderful informational podcast that delves into any particular subject um, that I find really interesting, very informative, but she always ends every episode with two questions to uh, the host. And so Nate, the first one is just because we're all in conservation, we're all conservation minded in this, like in this field or in specific <laughs> occupation, what is your least favorite part uh, of your job uh, working in the field? Oh, in the field? Okay, so we're not counting office duties. Or that. <laughs> Doing my timesheet has become a real pain in the neck, but that's another deal. It gets me a paycheck, so I can't complain. Uh, in the field, wow. That, uh, I'll, let me think about that. That's a great question. Um, I, I do enjoy a lot of what I do in the field there. I'm trying to think. So I think for me, like some of the toughest times are when you get into the, the blazing heat of summer. I have found early spring and late fall to be really nice times to be out in the field. Summer can be good, but um, when you get out there and, and you're kind of doing some monotonous stuff, or if you get to the point where you're I would say weather extremes is probably the easiest way to put it. Cause I've been out when it's super hot and you're melting. I've been, mm -hmm. I've had days where I'm doing snorkeling in a river and as we're driving down to the site, there's frost on the ground in the morning. And so that can get really uncomfortable. So I think that there's a comfort, yeah, there's a definitely a comfort zone, a temperature threshold thing there. So I think working in some of those temperature extremes is hard for me. I've worked, I've worked all through the night before I've actually worked probably literally every other day which, which is fine because I'm, I'm driven to find some secretive frog that just happens to be breeding that night. But the temperatures can start to get tough after a while. Yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> Anyone who experiences field work knows that, yeah, knows the experience. Um, but here's the second part then. So as a herpetologist, as a researcher, as you know, working for DNR, um, what is your, I know you've touched on this prior, like earlier in this discussion, but what is your favorite part of what you do? Mm. Well, this is great. I'm getting like these positive feelings, even as I think about this stuff, it just feels good to kind of talk about it. Um, I, I really like documenting and like discovering new populations of rare and endangered species. To me, that's like one of the most satisfying things I do. So those green salamanders I mentioned earlier on that one slide, there's only about a dozen different sites that they're known from in Indiana, and it's all in an area that's smaller than Monroe County. That's an Appalachian species we just happen to have here. So when I go out and I search these out rock outcrops and cliffs where they live in the cracks and fissures of these, of these cliffs, and we find a new population, and maybe it's even in like a new watershed or something, man, that lights me up. I get excited about that because it's like a it may sound simplistic, but it's a little bit like a treasure hunt, and, but, but it's a different type of treasure. And going out and discovering, you know, spadefoot toads calling in you know, another corner of the state where they've never been found before, and they're pretty hard to find unless you go out right when they're calling after a storm, uh, that is just very satisfying for me. And so I think that's probably my sweet spot uh, when it comes to doing the work I do as a herpetologist is, you know, making those discoveries and those finds. And it, admittedly, it's not just because I feel like I contributed something to science. It's just personally very satisfying. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much, Nate. Um, passion you. just radiates off of everything that you do and what you say. So it's been an absolute honor having you with us tonight. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to get together and talk to people, like-minded people who enjoy this kind of stuff. Even if herbs isn't their thing, Maybe someone just got an inch closer to be in their thing. Who knows? No. We had beaver believers last month, and now we've got the herb. I don't know. We got to work on that one. 
uh, hurt, the, the hurt hopefuls. The, mm. uh, the hurt hopeful. I like that a lot, actually. The hurt hopefuls. That's what us. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Um, so yes, everyone be sure to join us in June when we talk with Carol Ritter about Magnificent Trees of Indiana. Um, but thank you so much, Nate, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, and I learned a ton and continue to learn a lot when I'm out in the field doing herp work. So hope everyone else learns some stuff too. All right. Thank you, yep. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. All right.